This is the DRF Players Podcast. Hello and welcome to the April 13th edition of the DRF Players Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Thomas Fornital, back with you alongside, as always, at DRF Formulator, Mike Hogan. Mike, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Pete. Good to talk to you again. and uh, It's another uh, exciting week of racing. This should be a really fun podcast. We have three guests lined up for today's show. A little bit later, we're going to bring in our sort of semi-permanent regular floating guest, Jonathan Kinchin. We'll be talking about some of the weekend races with us and doing some tournament talk. Late in the show today, we're going to bring in Harvey Pack for a tale from the track about his time working with Denny Phipps. But we're going to start things off with a regular correspondent and uh, one of my favorite guys to talk racing with, racing both of the U.K. variety and U.S.A. variety. He is in his base out in California where he covers all the goings-on on the scene for Daily Racing Form. Hello, Steve Anderson. How are you today? And greetings from California. Everything's going really well. Looking forward to uh, a change of scenery at Los Alamitos starting tomorrow for three weekends, and it uh, should be a a fun rest of the month in and of itself just to see some uh, different uh, a different venue and then get back to Santa Anita for the uh, spring summer meeting, which, uh, of course, they just concluded their winter spring meeting last last Sunday with a very, very uh, impressive weekend of racing, particularly on Saturday. So it's, there's a lot going on out on the West Coast right now. Absolutely. Actually, let's look forward before we look back and talk about Los Alps for a second because I know that you guys have a webinar coming up that folks who are listening are going to want to register for. Mike, what's the story with this Los Alamitos webinar uh, that, that's happening tomorrow, is it? That's right, yeah. It's, um, Steve and I will be hosting a webinar at um, 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific time uh, on DRF.com. There will be banners. You can sign up if you're listening before this. Um, by all means, go to DRF.com. You'll see the, the heading to register for the webinar. Uh, if you're m listening to this after the webinar has happened, it will be posted to DRF.com slash YouTube, and you can watch it. Um, and really the topic is, as Steve mentioned, you know, we're, we're, we're switching to Low Sal for a little bit. Um, it's an all-dirt surface. It plays a little differently, obviously, than Santa Anita does. So we'll be using Formulator, and we'll be looking at... Uh, some of the things to keep an eye on at the current or upcoming Los Al meet. So, Steve, these days with so with the Santa Anita meet uh, being the portion of the calendar it is, do you look forward to Los Al as a breath of fresh air? I think so because it's particularly this year because uh, there, there is a, a, ni a nice short three-week meeting at Los Al, which will have some very good races, a $200,000 Philly and Mare Sprint, the Great Lady M Stakes on April 23rd. They're two 100 granders this weekend. It'll do just fine. And then uh, at the end of the a month, on April uh, 30th, the Saturday, there's the $150,000 California Chrome Stakes. It's, it's not out of the realm of possibility that somebody could race in that and then go to the Preakness or the Belmont. Um, so we'll see how that field shapes up. But what, it, what this provides is a much-needed disruption to the Santa Anita meeting. Santa Anita in 2014 and 2015, following the closure of Hollywood Park at the end of 2013, ran six consecutive months from Christmas time through to the 1st of July before Los Alamitos ran a two-week meet that led into Del Mar. So now this year, that calendar is slightly different. And because of that, there's, there's a chance to kind of go to Santa Anita until the 1st of April, first couple weeks of April, go to Los Al for a few weeks, then go back to Santa Anita. And I think Santa Anita will benefit by that because they will have a bit more of a boost at the end because people won't be so worn down by the same racing at the same venue. And when I say people, I mean everybody from you and I as, as race fans and journalists to, to the people who put on the show behind the scenes. I think it's going to be a nice little change because that leads into Del Mar in and of itself. I think, I think Los Alamitos will benefit because they're in a slightly different position in the calendar. Since they began racing in the daytime and thoroughbred racing, uh, in 2014 to, to take some of the dates that had previously been run at Hollywood Park, they have always been right before right or, or right after the Del Mar Summer Meeting or right before the San Diego Winter Spring Meeting, which is kind of the start of the fiscal horse racing year, so to speak, at Christmas time every year. So in, sure. in that regard, they're in a different portion of the calendar, and their first two days of entries for Thursday and Friday were fairly good. They weren't great. They were fairly good. And I think that might be 
a sign that people want to race in a different venue. Certain horses are, are catered to at Los Alamitos that may not be competitive or may not even get a start at Santa Anita. Well, that's a great point. And speaking of Santa Anita, you mentioned the great weekend of racing. Let's dive in and talk about that for a little bit. Uh, I guess there were sort of co-headlines in the three-year-olds that ran there on Saturday. But let's start out with the Santa Anita Derby and Exaggerator, who earned the, the lofty for this crop by our speed figure of 103. Steve, what did you think of Exaggerator's performance? I thought it was very, very good. I, I was thinking as the race unfolded that the pace was a little too quick, and uh, he benefited from that, and he ran a very, very brave race. So he's run... Uh, you know, three times this year, and he ran very well to Nyquist in the San in the San Vicente at seven eights. He was beaten in the San Felipe, but I think this most recent performance erases the disappointment from the San Felipe. And now we're looking at a colt who's going towards Kentucky at 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 peak uh, form, and I think he's going to be considered uh, on everyone's short list, and rightfully so. You know, you deal with circumstances. Well, it was a muddy track and a fast pace. Well. You know, there's very many Kentucky Derbies that are run at a very fast pace, and the weather in Kentucky is unpredictable in the spring. So I don't think he's a I don't think he's a mutter by any means. His past performances behind this have proven that he can run on just about any surface, and he has traveled already, having gone to Louisiana, for example. So I think that there's a lot to like about Exaggerator, and a lot to expect. Uh, uh, you know, further development from him, even though he's going to be facing some pretty tough assignments. That old nemesis Nyquist is right there waiting for him as well. Coming into the race, my biggest concern with Exaggerator was based on some of the trainer quotes, not sure if he would get the distance of the Santa Anita Derby, thinking maybe he didn't want to go much farther than a mile. After the race, do we write this off to um, just tra tra what you might call trainer speak, um, or is this a lingering concern? I don't necessarily think it's a lingering concern. Uh, you know, I, I do think that he can get a longer distance race um, effectively, as shown on Saturday. I think that also might be a reflection of the personality of trainer Keith DeSormo in so much as he's oftentimes the sort of guy who, who thinks out loud, and he, do, he, does, he does so in a very candid way sometimes, and he'll, he, he's, he's fun to speak to uh, because he, he often does open up about where his thought processes are as he develops his racehorses, and not just exaggerator either. Uh, he's got a really nice filly called Decked Out, who is going to be at Kentucky to, uh, Churchill Downs as well that weekend, and she won a grade three on the turf uh, very convincingly at Santa Anita last Saturday too. So and he's he's talked a lot about those horses and others in his barn in, in recent years about how, how he wants to go forward. So in that regard, I think that you're dealing with somebody who, un, unlike some trainers, for better or worse, uh, has a lot to say. <laughs> That's got to be a joy as a reporter, I, yes. I would assume. And, and as a gambler, you just need to know that. I mean, I... There are some who tell you, oh, don't worry about the trainer quotes and your handicapping. But I think it comes down to what you were uh, intimating, Steve, that it depends on who you're talking to and knowing how they approach it. If you know a certain trainer doesn't typically talk up their horses, for example, and you hear some heavy praise, that's information you can use. If you know a trainer's more of a think-out-loud sort like that, well, you've got to factor that in, too, uh, b before you go and, and make a, a wagering decision to potentially derail your day. Uh, you hearing anything <laughs> specific about how he, how he come, came out of the race? Uh, speaking to, to Keith on the morning afterwards, he was very content with the horse's condition, so that's a good sign going into uh, going into the, you know, the month of April, the, the rest of the month of April, and he, he was really just sort of at that point planning on how to how to manage the horse through April and it seems, sounds as if right now that uh, both Exaggerator and Songbird, the Sandy to Oaks winner, are going to stay in California until right before race time, which means probably a ship to Kentucky on the Monday or the Tuesday of, of, of Kentucky Derby Week. That's the perfect segue to talking about Songbird, the Santa Anita Oaks winner. She ran a 93 buyer speed figure, but that performance wasn't about the figure. It was once again about the ease with which she accomplished it and, and the way she moves. She's one of those. She's, she catches the eye and impresses, um, overwhelms even when you watch her visually. Do you agree with that, and what did you think of her effort in general? She's perfect. <laughs> I don't know that there might not be a better racehorse in the country right now. Well, Mike Smith had some extremely lofty quotes praising her, not just 
relative to three-year-old fillies he sat on, which he'd already done earlier in the year, but now even comparing her favorably to some of the great three-year-old colts that he sat on. Now, obviously, jockeys, um, you know, you're going to get very excited about the horses you're, you're, you're sitting on you're sitting on currently. But, I mean, but what do you think of that notion that she could truly be um, not just not just a great three-year-old filly, but a great three-year-old. Yes, I do agree with that. And I have to qualify what I just said in, in, in the context of, you know, we won't see her in the Kentucky Derby. There is a, a little fellow named California Chrome sitting on a farm in Kentucky waiting to race in the second half of the year, too. So, in the, But what's exciting about her is that no matter I, – I always enjoy watching fillies race, um, particularly um, three-year-old fillies and, and older fillies. Um, you know, Beholder, for example, has been a, a thrill to watch. She's a three-time champion, of course, who starts her first season in May. And, and this filly is, 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 resembles her in the sense that she always gives a, a very good performance and, and a very, very good performance. And I don't really know what we're dealing with yet. And I've asked Jerry Hollander for that repeatedly. I said, Jerry, what is she? And he goes, I, he just doesn't, he can't even get there because he doesn't know w what the testing mark will be. Will it, will, you know, I think she's going to be one to two in the Kentucky Oaks. That might even be optimistic. If she loses, it'd be a shock. There's no two ways to discuss it. Secondly, you know, at that point, then there's going to be conversations. Well, will you do a Rachel Alexander and swing her back in the Preakness? Don't expect it. No. He's, the, Rick Porter is taking a very conservative approach towards the, the management of this filly's career as it pertains to racing against males. Would that open up something like, uh, you know, a start against the males in the second half of the year? I don't necessarily think so. I mean, speaking with Jerry on Sunday, Sunday morning, he mentioned races that, you know, like Delaware uh, in July and the Alabama. Uh, that's Saratoga, pardon me, in, in, in August as goals for her. And then, you know, then you start realizing at that point that you're almost on top of the Breeders' Cup at Santa Anita, November 4 or 5. In that regard, I wouldn't be surprised if she stays within the three-year-old Philly division through the summer and the Philly and Mare division in the autumn. Do you get the impression they're thinking at, I mean, I know this is kind of a crazy question in April, but do you get any inkling that maybe they're thinking about a four-year-old campaign for this one? Do yeah, you have I, think any... a bit. I think that's kind of like there's, there's preliminary discussions about there's no use quitting this party. Right. <laughs> no Excellent. Well, that's any party, really, in, in any form of life, actually. But in this particular case, I don't think that, uh, that, that, that they're thinking, okay, three more starts and then off to, off to breeding. I don't believe that's in the mindset right now. A couple more three-year-olds I want to ask you about, Steve, before we before we let you go today. One of them won the nightcap on Saturday for a very familiar name in Bob Baffert, a horse named American Freedom, who broke his maiden with a 98 buyer speed figure. Did, had you heard much about this horse coming into the race? Other than it was a big ticket uh, auction purchase, had not been a whole lot of discussion with him. Baffert's been really focused on more spirit, trying to get that horse towards Kentucky, thinking he's his best chance for Triple Crown success this year. So there had been, you know, widespread, you know, respect for that horse going into the race on, on Saturday evening. But uh, quite frankly, I think that uh, it's, it's going to have to prove his way. I wouldn't be surprised at all if he's on the traveling party to Churchill for an allowance race, uh, you know, the first of the meet there. You mentioned well, more Steve, spirit. I heard... We should pick up that thread. Oh, you go ahead, Mike, and then we'll, we'll loop back to more spirit. Yeah, I, I heard after American Freedom's debut, and I think it might have been to Jay Privman, uh, Baffert uh, made a comment, oh, I think I found my my Haskell horse. Um, so it does sound like he's, he's uh, at least at some point going to travel, likely, but you, you could be right that there might be a race in between and maybe on the on the uh, Kentucky De uh, Derby undercard. I believe that's right. that that makes perfect sense. I think he does have a horse that's going to be a bit of a late developer who could you know be in the discussion for some very important races in the summer. What is your thought regarding more spirit, Steve? Not, not exactly uh, what you'd call an in inspiring effort in the Santa Anita Derby, but maybe not all that bad with the inherent excuses built in. Uh, where do you stand with him going forward? I'm against him. I think he's a very nice racehorse, a Grade One winner at Los Alamitos in December in the fraternity and a very smart winner of the Robert Lewis Stakes in February, uh, you know, certainly uh, bona fide credentials across, but I'm just a little skeptical that now two races in a row, he seems to find a way to be beaten, and uh, I was discouraged by his loss to Danzig Candy in the San Felipe on March 12th. Um, can't really hold this race against him in the same capacity. Uh, Stevens came back l looking like a, just totally covered in mud, so the horse took, took the worst of the uh, kickback and the worst of the 
of the trip in, in, in regards to the conditions on Saturday. Um, you know, you can see him in the first four at Churchill, but I wouldn't bank too heavily on it. We'll touch more on the Santa Anita Derby a little bit later in the show when Jonathan Kinchin joins us. Before we let you go, Steve, a couple other questions I wanted to ask. Another concerns a three-year-old, this one a Philly who ran on Sunday, and judging from Mike Hogan's Twitter feed, he, he's got a little bit of uh, a little minor obsession, I think, with, uh, with <laughs> Anola Gray, this Calbred winner who ran a 99 buyer speed figure. Is, is Mike on to something here? Are we dealing with, uh, dealing with a horse with some big potential for down the line? Yes, uh, just spoke to Phil D'Amato this morning about this filly uh, 40 minutes ago, and the race goals now are, are, are rather moderate um, for the immediate. There's the Fleet Treat Stakes for Calbred fillies at Del Mar worth $200,000, uh, worth $150,000, pardon me, and that is a goal that they've set. They haven't put up a whole lot of uh, prestigious goals at this point with this filly. It's, it must be remembered that in California, as soon as the spring ends, it all goes to the grass. You know, the, the Summertime Oaks, the grade two race at Santa Anita in, in June is the last graded stake uh, for the division until the, the small Tory Pine Stakes at Delmar, which is a grade three. So in that regard, you know, I think he really wants to kind of check her over. He, he said today that he, he didn't have any immediate plans. I was wondering if he might think she's worthy of the $75,000 three-year-old Philly stake at Los Al on the 17th, but he, he or, or the 24th rather, but he was not... Uh, not of that mindset, and uh, he thinks he's kind of wants to cool her out a little bit, see where she stands, and look to some optional claimers and such until we get down to Delmar. The circuit gets down to Delmar, and, and she might, you know, have a chance to really perform in her own division, and, and in a sense, develop her slowly, which is kind of uh, reassuring in a way, because you can imagine that the temptation after a race like that is to just go for big money in the next available spot. Uh-uh, she's not that experienced. She's very, very fast. And the only thing that Tyler Bays told owner and breeder Nick Alexander when he climbed off of her and, and visited with him in the winter circle was, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's well, great. It, I, think, I think that's really the only thing anybody who's watched her race has said about it. I mean, you've got a horse that looked like Tyler never moved. He never asked her. She just widened throughout. Um, maybe ran slightly greenly, but even still is within three-fifths of the second of the track record um, for a three-year-old filly making her first career start. Um, you know, I think wow is what you'd say about <laughs> that race. So, uh, you know, she's she certainly one to watch, and it's, it's good to hear that they, that they aren't uh, going to be overly optimistic, uh, at least initially, and in, in, in spot her in uh, more realistic spots because she, she could be good. All right, Steve, i I, I got to let you go here in a minute. But before I do that, I have to ask about your experience at this year's Cheltenham Festival. I was uh, green, if not purple, with envy <laughs> while you were over there for the four days. Had some, some fantastic championship-level uh, national hunt racing, as always. What were the highlights for you, and how was your experience in general? One of the finest festivals I've seen. It's my 15th Gold Cup, and I was very fortunate to be there this year. I was impressed by Thistle, Thistle Creek and the World Hurdle at three miles. Uh, sure. Forum that was uh, flattered when he came back to win at Aintree on the weekend. I uh, thought that uh, Sprinter Sakura was probably probably the most sentimental win you've ever, you've seen in, in any races in the last probably five or ten years, going going back to the Zenyatta the Zenyatta era in Southern California because that horse had been a t classic two mile chaser and and at or five four years ago. Then he had a heart problem and he missed last year because of bad form and they said he was washed up and he came back and he won he won the it's kind of fun to see. Uh, I, I'm very impressed by the mayor Annie Power and the champion hurdle and, uh, and, and and other runners that look very good on the day. And I think the, the Gold Cup winner Don Cossack's a good horse, but I don't know if it's a vintage Gold Cup group right now. And uh, the Three Mile Chasers are a fascinating group, and it, they they seem to be kind of taking turns this 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 season in a way. So it's it was very fun. It wasn't the most profitable meeting. I'm a little discouraged with myself. <laughs> <laughs> not putting together a little more sensible betting point of view, but I think life's lessons are learned along the way, and uh, I shall be assaulting those same bookmakers uh, one week after the Breeders' Cup Classic this fall. Oh, you're going back for the for the open meeting in November? November. Yeah, they have a three-day meeting in November, which, as you know, is growing leaps and bounds. And what's fascinating about Cheltenham, just to give people an overview, it's four days of racing, national hunt racing, seven races a day. Nothing is shorter than two miles. Nothing is longer than four miles. Fences, hurdles, banks. Hedges. It's a very fascinating uh, code of racing, and uh, over the four days this year, which was March uh, 
you know, which was March uh, 15 through 18, there were 260,000 people over four days. So anybody who says the on-track experience is diminished or is, is uh, uh, you know, that we've, we've gone into a world where we don't have to be there needs to go there and see what can and, and see what it looks like. And uh, the, my Facebook page and my, my Twitter feed at DRF Anderson has a few of those photos as well. Oh, fantastic. I'll make sure to go back and check those out again. I agree, Steve. Nowhere does the intersection of racing as sport and gambling game present itself like it does at Cheltenham. I can only imagine the scenes in the winner's enclosure, uh, for, especially for Sprinter Sacra, people going there. I, I, I imagine there, there was laughter, there was tears. Uh, they, they must have been freaking out. Did you, did you happen to get there to look at that at all? Very much so. I watched. I was down in the amphitheater when he walked in because it, it really isn't a, a really beautiful bowl there, much like Longchamp. And it's it's nice to be able to see that eight or six or eight thousand people literally can can witness it because of the way that they redesigned it with a hundred million dollar investment over the last two years. They put a lot of dollars into the race course, and and uh, one of the benefits of that is people can really take part in 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 Winter Circle or because the winter circle and the walking ring are behind the stand and they're one and the same and it's it's fascinating to be able to see that many people be able to check out horses before they race and then come back and watch the ceremony afterwards and that was really really a uh, an exciting moment for any, anybody's assessment and it left uh, Nikki Henderson the horse's trainer and one of the finest jump trainers in the world in tears so you knew it, it probably moved uh, moved his heart a little bit to see that it makes up for a, probably a lot of cold 38 degree Wednesdays in January when you <laughs> get out there and start training the horses. Oh, that's amazing. Note, note to self, clip this little two-minute segment of the podcast and send it to some uh, some friends in the publicity office over in Cheltenham to get in for free next year. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate all of your time today, and we look forward to having you on again soon. And everybody should definitely check out Steve and Mike on the webinar, Los Alamitos via Formulator tomorrow, 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific. Thanks, gentlemen. Thanks, Steve. All right, good stuff as always from Steve Anderson. Um, I don't have the little webinar tool in front of me. Do we have our next guest, Jonathan Kinchin, uh, w with us at this point? I'm here. I'm ready to rock and roll, man. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I should know you're there. You, you, you come and join the podcast even when you're not invited. So I figure when you're, we're back on a proper schedule here, there'd be no doubt that you'd show up. Yeah, I just I was a little bit nervous with Nick being on that I didn't want you guys to forget about me. I thought I was gonna get the uh, old Wally Pitt deal. I knew Nick was gonna be awesome. I thought I had thought I was gonna be replaced. I thought I had no shot at getting back on. <laughs> well, dude, you you are you you you're, you're not right about being replaced, of course. But you are right that the man was awesome. Not only was he the he, he's very articulate. He speaks with great authority without being like without having a, a for me anyway a trace of arrogance, which is hard to do. Uh, but he was also kind of giving out winners like uh, most people fall out of bed. So he will definitely be on again soon. So if you're, you know, someday you've got a scratchy throat, we need to make a call to the bullpen and bring him in. I'm, I'm not saying we don't want you, Jonathan, but we can, we can survive without you, okay? Yeah, no, I know, I understand. <laughs> While we have you today, I know you're traveling today, and we'll talk about why towards the end of your segment here today. But, but while we have you, I want to at least get your thoughts and get Mike's thoughts on the three derby preps. We already talked a little bit about the Santa Anita Derby. We'll start off with that one. This is what it sounded like. Here comes Exaggerator, mounting a mighty bid around the outside as they turn for home in the million dollar Santa Anita Derby, and Exaggerator has gone straight past them like they were tied to the rail. At the eighth pole, Exaggerator five lengths over Uncle Lino, more spirit and dancing candy, but Exaggerator is finishing with conviction this afternoon. Exaggerator, an absolutely brilliant victory in the Santa Anita Derby over more spirit Uncle Lino. Lino and Danzing Candy Fourth. That's what it sounded like. Thank you so much to Michael Rona for the call. Exaggerator earning that big buyer speed figure, announcing himself yet again as a player on the Kentucky Derby Trail, giving a nice form boost to Nyquist in the process. Guys, what did we think of this effort? Jonathan, I'll start with you. Well, watching it back again as it was playing, I, it, it reminded me so much of Texas Reds Breeders' Cup Juvenile. Same rider, um, same idea. Uh, you know, to me, 
I'm going to quote my friend Eric Bialik, and I, I gave him a little bit of love on Twitter. Last year when we were at, uh, at the Whitney, he, he said something. We kept talking about how Honor Code was a one-turn horse, is a one-turn horse, is a one-turn horse. And Eric said, you know, one-turn horses can win two-turn races when they get one-turn setups. And mm -hmm. I just I think that's exactly what happened. I think that Exaggerator is still a one-turn horse in my opinion. He won as impressively as you can win, but he got the greatest setup you can ask for. He got the surface that he's accelerated on, and um, he got uh, you know he got a, a crazy fast pace to run into. Um, he is an absolute play against for me moving forward, and I've already made that decision. There's nothing that's going to change my mind. He's going to get bet, and 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 I'm going to have nothing to do with him. When you talk about the surface, you mean that you think that the muddy track moved him up as it did in the race at Delta? Absolutely, yeah. Sorry, I wasn't, wasn't clear about that. Uh, Mike, what what is your, are you as you know? Steve was fairly optimistic. Jonathan fairly pessimistic. Uh, where do you fall in this continuum? Uh, I'm closer to Jonathan, but um, I would I would probably use him a little bit defensively uh, if I was playing any sort of multi race wagers. Um, I said before the race uh, on Twitter. I said before all three of these preps that we're, we're going to be talking about. I said. I have a really hard time imagining that the Kentucky Derby winner is going to be anybody other than a West Coast horse. And by West Coast, I mean West Coast based. So that would include Cupid. Um, that would include any of the, the the top three from a betting standpoint, at least in the in the Santa Anita Derby. That that being more Spirit and Dancing Candy as well. Uh, that being, of course, Nyquist. Uh, maybe one or two others. I think that the West Coast horses, as we will discuss in the other races, is shown by how well some maidens from the West Coast have run in some of these other points races. I think the West Coast horses are just much better than the others, and if it does end up, if he does end up getting the, the kind of pace meltdown that he needs or something similar to what he got in the Santa Anita Derby, I could see Exaggerator turning the tables on many of these horses that have beat him uh, prior, including Nyquist. That sound you just heard was Ron Moquette crossing Mike Hogan off his Christmas card list, by the way. <laughs> but, uh, Jonathan, what, any horses coming out of that Santa Anita Derby that you are interested in, in taking a look at going forward? Yeah, I, 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 uh, I told Nick this, and he wasn't really feeling me, but I, I, uh, Nick Tamara, I told him, I kind of want Danza Candy a little bit moving forward. Um, you know, I've talked a lot about how I like horses that are going to be forwardly placed, and a lot less uh, negative things can happen to them. Um, the Derby hasn't been blazing fast the last three years since they've, the point system has kind of excluded some crazy sprinters from showing up. And he's just the type of horse that I think that off of that effort, um, you know, as much as he put into it, there's, he's the type of horse that, in my opinion, could stick around. I, I don't see him as a win candidate by any means, but he's the type of horse I think that will be ignored on the board and, and the type of horse that could kind of sneak in for second or third um, or even fourth if, if, if things were to, to slow down on the front end. I, I much prefer him. Uh, over exaggerator in that spot. Now he's a, a clear flow move up. I think I didn't see. I haven't done notes on the race yet, but in my mind's eye, look, thinking back to the start, he didn't break very well, did he? Um, I don't. I can't remember exactly how the start was. I just know that Mike sent him away from there, and and, and my my first impression was, ah, Mike's going to try to wire him like he just did with Songbird, and then it just happened to blow up in his face. Well, not only that, so so watch the replay, because not only that, um, he was acting up in the gate. He was he was fractious in the gate. He was not settled. Um, he, the, the gate opens. He maybe didn't break best, and then he was a runoff. I mean, this is a draw a line through it kind of performance for me. I'm, I'm with Jonathan here. Uh, I think he can run much better than what you saw in the Santa Anita Derby. Very interesting points both uh, of you making there about the Santa Anita Derby. That was one of three prep races we're going to talk about today. We're going to move on to the next one, which took place at Keeneland. Here's Kurt Becker with the call. Loudman and Star Hill, 1-2 off the far turn. Brody's Cause has work to do to catch them. They're coming to the eighth pole. Cards of Stone fourth. Cherry Wine is fifth up on the outside. My Man Sam is on the grandstand side in sixth. Brody's Cause just keeps grinding away. Cherry Wine is running late on the outside. Brody's Cause at the 16th pole. Chased by Cherry Wine. My Man Sam running huge from last. But Brody's Cause in front. Brody's Cause for Luis Saez. 
to win the Toyota Bluegrass from my man Sam and then Cherry Wine. Further back, Lauban, one minute, 50 and one fifth seconds. I had mentioned on the webinar we did last week with Steve and Chris that with a big effort, I thought that Brody's cause could uh, reassert himself as well into the top of the market for the Kentucky Derby. Mike, are you buying what Brody's cause is selling? <laughs> well, I think I kind of tipped my hand a little bit in talking about the Santa Anita Derby. The short answer is I don't really want anybody out of that bluegrass. I, I didn't think it was a very strong field going in. Brody's cause was the only stakes winner of the 14 horses entered. He's now still the only stakes winner of the 14 horses entered. Um, he got uh, the kind of setup that he's needed in, in his other races where he's finished first. Um, I guess if he gets that kind of setup again, you know, he could be a player, but I just don't even think he's the best closer that's likely to start in the Derby. His buyer speed figure was only 91. It's his top career uh, effort. Um, he's going to have to improve and improve quite a bit uh, to win the Derby. It's possible. Uh, I think he's going to be a little over bet. Um, based on those those wins and that effort, and uh, I'm not in love with them. Jonathan, you made the point that Exaggerator was the beneficiary of a setup. I'd argue Brody's cause was a beneficiary of an even better setup because not only did the uh, did the, the pace of the bluegrass stakes suggest that a closer was likely to win, it was also run on a racing surface that, to my eye, favored horses with an off-the-pace running style. Or do you have similar criticisms of Brody's cause, or are you seeing a silver lining here? Yeah, and just to add one more point, and also against a bunch of horses that I just didn't really think uh, were very good. With all that said, there's no way in heck if I play a superfecta or a, or a trifecta that I will not have this horse in third or fourth. Dale Roman's record in this race, getting horses to hit the board, is entirely too good to discount this horse completely. Um, I just think that his that the way that not even the horse himself, just the way that Dale Romans trains horses leading up to the Derby with with really intense gallops. I just feel like the horse is the type of horse that will hold on for a piece. Um, I'll be listening to Mike Welsh. If Mike Welsh says the horse is training well, he'll be an include for me underneath. Uh, but no no place on top or in second for me. I just don't see. I don't think the horse is good enough. Jonathan references those DRF clocker reports that are so critical for understanding of the derby. Mike, when are those uh, when are those going to be available? When do those start coming out specifically for horses who are going to be running in the derby, do you think? Oh, boy, you're asking me a question that we didn't prep prior. I have no idea. <laughs> um, probably, I would imagine the week leading up is usually when we start promoting them, And okay. um, but short answer is I don't know. Well, as a, God, as, a, as a huge fan of them, I will say that when the horses start showing up to Churchill, Welsh usually shows up and he starts doing the videos every day, which so it's not always mm -hmm. written up in an actual report. But if you jump on every day, there's videos where Welsh will get on and he'll kind of give a breakdown of all the horses that worked that morning and kind of tell his best work, his worst work, and kind of describe them. So uh, look at the video section. Um, once horses start showing up at Churchill, they'll start working. Leave it to the non-DRF uh, employee to do a better job <laughs> promoting DRF products than the two <laughs> DRF employees, by the way. Jonathan, you made the case for Danzig Candy based on uh, based on a number of factors. Here's just a goofy idea. Is Lobon the Danzig Candy of the bluegrass? And what I mean by that is the horse who set the pace that set it up for the closer, in this case, still beat most of the field, was fourth, not beaten, you know, beaten whatever it was, seven or eight, but hung around at the end a little bit. Would you give this horse consideration for maybe fourth and a super under the same logic as Danzig Candy, or, or am I talking crazy? No, I think so. I mean, I think especially if you look back at our experiment we've been doing this this uh, you know this year so far with with red boarding the Derby, you continuously find these races in which horses have bad performances that are hidden, um, but they overcame some type of a pace disadvantage, and and that's what I think that Danzig Candy and Loban both have in their favor. Um, you know, I think Loban got a little bit ignored on Saturday because of the apparent golden rail that we all uh, were aware of at uh, on Gotham Day. Gotham and Day. So, Being a maiden didn't help either. Right, absolutely. But, you know, I've been impressed with Loban. I thought he ran huge in his races at Santa Anita. You know, when you guys are doing your work, look at that race that he ran against that more – I think it was uh, maybe more Spirit One or – no, the other horse, Gifted, the other Baffert horse uh, – Collected, maybe. Collected. Collected one. Collected. Oh, oh right, right, right. I know what you mean. 
watch that race. I think it was maybe the sham. I mean, Lowman got the worst ride ever. He was like six wide the entire time and ran pretty darn well. I think he's actually a good horse, so he would definitely be one that I would consider moving forward. Mike, any others for you? Uh, I mean, you, 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 again, you hinted at this, but, but if you had to take a horse out of, uh, out of the bluegrass, is there anybody who leaps to mind? Yeah, well, I mean, I think I liked my man Sam going in. Um, I think he's probably got more, a little bit more upside, um, say, than Brody's cause does. Uh, I don't know if we've seen the best yet from my man Sam, and he's shown, at least on the buyers, that he's run faster than he did in the bluegrass. He was uh, trying to run down. He was a little, you know, Brody's cause basically got the jump on him. Um, he's one that I pref of the two, he's he's the one I prefer. Uh, but I agree about Lauban. I mean, he was in addition to setting that pace and, and holding on pretty well. He was pretty unprepared for the start. Um, he had to rush up a little bit. You know, those are the kinds of efforts that uh, that I I will upgrade. Um, and he's going to be a maiden if he makes the field, which he, it looks like he very well might. He's going to be a maiden in the Derby, which means he's going to be a huge price, and uh, I would absolutely use him um, underneath if not on top. Now, last week on the show, we did a segment where we opened up to questions from the listeners. We used Periscope. We did this whole little bit. This week, I'm going to turn that uh, paradigm around, and I, I have a question for the listeners. Okay, folks, if you've been listening to the podcast regularly, the next time you see Todd Pletcher adding blinkers to a short-priced favorite heading into a graded stake, what are you going to do with the horse? <laughs> you guys can think about that for a minute. You can hit pause, and then you can come back, and I'll tell you the answer. And the answer is I think you're going to toss the horse. <laughs> Zulu yeah. Um, yeah. Did not, uh, pretty much of a complete no-show as far as I was concerned. Had that angle that we, we talked about. I think we talked about it on the pod. We definitely talked about it in the webinar we did. Um, for me, just, just a, a very difficult angle to, to support making a change that big um, under those circumstances. And what now, Mike, is the record with that stat do you have? I didn't, we didn't have this question either. <laughs> I, you might not have it. But it's, uh, it is well, good. I think it was. It was two for 21 going in. Only four others hit the board, so I guess it's now two for 22 with only six hitting the board. A lot of them were short prices. That's the um, key my thing question, for me. Yeah, my my question for you guys is: Was it the blinkers, which I think, in my mind, signifies you know uh, Pletcher is trying to make a change with the horse in a in a stakes race like this? It's often not a positive, but. Was it the blinkers that led to the poor performance, or is Zulu perhaps not as good? And this is even a further downgrade of Mohamed, considering how close he ran to Mohamed uh, in in the prior start. Uh, I'll let you I mean, tackle I think, that, Jonathan. I think it's a fair assessment. I mean, I guess I don't really know. I'll be honest. I was, I kind of thought he was going to run well. Um, I had noticed in the workout report that he had outworked. Um, it's a knockout, who I think is a, is a really good horse. Um, and, and I thought he was going to run well. Uh, our friend Gabby Gaudet sent me a message right before the race. We have this joke that she pointed out to us when we were all hanging out at Santa Anita one time. She calls it hop, head over pony. And when the horse, when they're in the, pro the post parade, if the, if the horse puts his head over the pony, it's like the worst sign you know, with her horseman background because it shows that they're not focused. And she texted me at Zulu's head was over pony, but I'd already put my play in, so I couldn't text her. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's not a great sign, and 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 I think that, that based on just basic math, yes, it's an absolute downgrade of Mohamed. All right, we will be calling Gabby Gaudet back on the show soon. She was on the show that you missed, Jonathan. I don't know if you went back and listened to that, but she did a fantastic job previewing the Florida Derby. Next time we have her on, we're going to talk about Hop Head Over Pony. We'll make a note of that. <laughs> um, there was another Derby prep race. We're not going to play the call. Um, but you know what? For two seconds, let's just talk about the call. Famously, we're talking about the wood. Um, poor Larry Comas. He does a great job. This was any race caller's nightmare to have a race in the mud with visibility not the greatest anyway, a horse with similar colors and similar equipment to another horse in the race making a move up the rail in a race that collapsed. It's going to happen. People are going to make mistakes. I thought it was cool that he owned it. Um, referencing it multiple times, actually, on the, the Naira slash MSG broadcast that was shown here in New York. I give him credit for acknowledging the mistake and wouldn't hold it against him at all. And I, I thought, I almost feel bad talking about it because I feel like it was kind of overblown to begin with. But what do, what do you guys think? 
Well, I think whatever your job is, you wake up every day, and I guarantee you screw up at least once a day. <laughs> and, uh, mm -hmm. In in my case, mm -hmm. sometimes more. <laughs> and that's and that's what it is. You know, it just happens where his screw up was public, and um, and it's in you know for everyone to be watching. So you know, kudos for him for for owning up to it, and uh, I anticipate that uh, he'll do fine in, in his coming calls of all the other big races he'll be calling. Yeah, and the only thing I'll add to that is I, I, I agree 100 percent. And anybody that that is blaming him or thinks that he screwed up or 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 is looking sideways at him about it, you know, he's one of the best in the business, if not the best in the business, um, with uh, you know some recent retire retirees um, now out. He he's the one I would want calling any big race. You know, you give him a pass for this, and anybody that's upset, look, it didn't change things one bit. It's not like you could have cashed. It's not like you know. It's, it's you know. I had a discussion with somebody. who was like, oh, it was like a referee making a bad call. It wasn't even like that because no, that affects no. the outcome. This did not yeah. even affect the outcome. That might cost so, you a bet. In fact, that does cost right. you a bet all the time. That, that's a great point. Sure. And, and and if people want to know the difference in an attitude between a winning player and a losing player, to me, like uh, a winning player isn't going to worry about stuff that doesn't affect their their bankroll. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, right. Is, yeah. yeah there's, there's not really much reason to harp on that. No, no. The, the bottom but let's talk about the you, race. Oh, you, you, you got one more point on this, Jonathan, before we talk about the race? Yeah, just look, if you, yeah, if you picked Adventist to run second and you're upset because he got you all excited, it doesn't change the fact that you were wrong. So it's, <laughs> it's <laughs> exactly. If they, if they believe that the caller has that kind of power to affect the outcome, uh, that that would be a very different game, and there'd be a lot more race callers. But mm -hmm. so Alwerf wins the race, earns a 93, bit of a redemption tale for Mike Rapoli, who of course uh, was very disappointed uh, several years back, I guess it was, was it 2010, when Uncle Mo, at odds of one to a zillion, was, uh, was beaten in the race. He is a Queens guy, he has been very aware of the wood from a very young age, and he was jumping around in the winner's circle after like St. John's had just made it to the final four. It was funny to watch on TV. Um, but, but, you know, the, the story aspect of it aside, Jonathan, what do we think of Outwork and his chances going forward? Well, I tell you, I don't want to say anyone's name. I'll tell you, a friend of mine thinks a lot of him. He's got a $1,000 future on the horse at like wow. 100-something to one. He's looking at like 86 grand if the horse wins the derby. So I know he'll be rooting for sure. Um, I don't know. I was underwhelmed going into the race. I thought he ran well. Um, you know, it's going to take some some really great workout reports and awful draws by other horses for me to try to get warmed up to outwork. I, I'm just not crazy about it. Shagoff, the favorite coming in, looked like he wasn't loving the ground. Then he sort of got into the race, and then he found very little. And again, this was a race where you would have thought it would have helped horses coming from off the pace. Is the Shagaf bandwagon closed for business, Mike? Uh, well, I was never on it to begin with, and I guess if those, those that were, uh, they kind of have a built-in excuse. You know, the, this is a lightly raced horse. He's, that was his only his fourth career start. You can maybe make the case that he didn't like the surface. Uh, if they continue on with him and go into the Kentucky Derby, which uh, initial reports from Chad Brown said that they are planning to, I mean, if you like them, that this effort only helps your price uh, at Churchill. Um, so, if you were a believer, I don't see the reason to jump off here. Um, but you know, I, I I never really thought he was one of the top three-year-olds that we've seen so far. You know, and, and a lot of people. One, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jonathan. No, one point I wanted to make. One point I wanted to make also is that you know we we talked about it earlier. I think that that his performance is another indication that that March fifth on Gotham Day. That inside was really good, and, yeah, that's a and good point. his performance, he ran really well then, and then he comes back and runs another, he runs a, a less than optimal performance. So I would expect that what he ran last Saturday is, is probably what he'll run derby-wise in terms of figures, not what he ran uh, back in the golf. Trojan Nation is the horse who did finish second. His presence in the race gives me several thoughts. Well, for a lot of people, I, I suppose, are questioning the form of the race and questioning outwork specifically because this uh, this Southern California also ran uh, Maiden going in, got so close to him at the end. Um, it was it certainly seemed like he moved up in the wet. It was certainly a clever ride by Aaron Grider. He also offers a little bit of a form boost for Cupid, I noticed. Cupid, who has him on the form book by about 10 lengths, 
Um, Jonathan, what did you think of Trojan Nation? Oh, let's does... go! Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know what that was. Following, um... Harvey's know, following... here. <laughs> following Southern California racing as, as much as I have this, this winter and, and early spring, I just had no positive notes on Trojan Nation moving forward to make me feel that he could compete with these types. You know, it was a slow pace with Cupid that he stalked that day and, and didn't really do anything. Uh, I guess he did close into a slow pace against Hoffenheim, but I think Hoffenheim's a, a below average uh, three-year-old. So uh, it, it just doesn't really do anything back in his form to make me feel better about the race itself or the horse itself. All right. Now, Jonathan, you've got a plane to catch. Before we bring in Harvey officially here, let's talk for two seconds about your uh, your tournament activities this weekend. Where, where can we expect to see your name on the leaderboard? Well, because they don't have an Eddie Logan suite, I'm going to my second favorite place in the world to hang out with my buddy Jim Goodman, who takes, a great, takes care of us and, um, amazingly at Keeneland. So I'm going to the Keeneland tournament. It's on Sunday. Um, but I couldn't justify just going for one day, so I'm going to go tonight so that I can be there for Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Uh, Friday, the Maker's Mile. Thursday, I'm sorry, Saturday, we get to see Teppin run. Um, so I'm looking forward to that, uh, to head out to the old bluegrass and, and, uh, and get to, to see some, some pretty exciting racing out at Keeneland. You'll be messing around with any online activity as well, or are you going to focus on, uh, going to focus on the, the grade one gamble at Keeneland? No, absolutely. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll be playing on Saturday to try to get qualified for Santa Anita so that I can get to the Eddie Logan Suite. Um, and then on That's Sunday, on drfqualify.com. Absolutely. And then on Sunday, I'll be on DRF Qualify as well, trying to get qualified for the Monmouth Tournament uh, the week before the Belmont Stakes. Excellent. All right, Jonathan. Thanks for your time today. Safe flying. I will see you out there. See you guys. All right. And with that, we're gonna bring in our third and final guest. One of the people to whom I owe my career, I used to sit at the side of the stage and point at him. Um, then one day he asked me to help write his book, which I've described as the easiest writing assignment I've ever had in my life, because basically it amounted to turning on the tape recorder and letting him talk. And these days, we don't get to hear nearly enough of this man talking. He is legendary broadcaster and raconteur Harvey Pack. Harvey, how are you doing today? Not bad, not bad, Pete. <laughs> you, you, you got to hear some of my broadcasting there for a few minutes uh, uh, while you were waiting. Uh, while you were waiting, theoretically on hold. That's what we do here on the DRF Players Podcast. We we sort of uh, shoot the breeze about the previous weekend's races on our Friday show. We preview them. But my favorite part of the show, which we don't do enough, which you've graciously agreed to help us out with today, is called Tales from the Track where we typically one of us, but, but I like this idea of bringing guests, to tell stories from the sort of rich tapestry of the racetrack world. And with the passing of Denny Phipps last week, I couldn't think of anybody better to come on and tell us a little bit about your relationship with Denny and what he meant to you and your career and to New York racing in general. It meant a lot to horse racing and a lot to the fans, which they don't even realize. Uh, after all, he was from one of the storied families in racing, and I'm happy to know they will continue to be, since uh, uh, one of the daughters and certainly the son love the game, so we'll have them. But Denny was an interesting character. He was in his 30s when he became chairman of Naira, and I was kind of scared of him because it's a name you've heard. If you're a horse player, you know the name. And, but he turned out to be a rather genial and nice person. And one day we were overhauling the mutual system completely. And we were putting in new machines where you could uh, bet on your own without assist. Something you people just take for granted. And while we were doing it, I piped up and said, why don't we put in a dollar bet? And everybody laughed. But Denny didn't laugh. Denny said, you know, that's not a bad idea. And we went over how casinos, you'll bet a buck if you win, you'll maybe bet five and then ten and then a hundred. And he said, let's do it. Now, I only meant for the exotics. But since that was impossible to put into the machine, we went to the dollar bet for everything. But I'm happy to know that today, every track in the country, seems to me, has a dollar bet. <laughs> that low minimums trend is definitely a big deal. I had no idea that, uh, that, that you had a part in, in, to play in those. Another way that you were an innovator along with handicapping contest play, which I know you had a 
hand not in inventing, but in helping to popularize. Yes, I did. In fact, I wrote an introduction for your book, which you didn't credit. <laughs> that was the designer's fault, I swear. Look at me throwing somebody else under the bus. No, in truth, it was my fault. Um, you, you, your name was bigger than mine on the title page, though. I will point that out. Well, it should be, right? hundred <laughs> percent. But tell anyway, folks who don't know how you helped bring contest play to New York. Well, we put it on. I would, my original idea was to have a million dollar first prize and run it for two, three weeks with an entry fee, which you have now. And I was sure that we'd get coverage in the paper when someone was going for a million dollars back in the late 70s and early 80s. The attorney general of the state of New York turned it down, claiming that handicapping was a game of pure chance. And the joke of it was he was a player and a regular at the track. So he <laughs> screwed us right then. <laughs> you did end up bringing in the contest with, it, with a free entry fee, though, and had some entertaining stories over the years. And certainly I think those contests were how many players first learned about handicapping contests. They were great fun. And all we did was work out ways that people could only enter once because people go in and out and enter 30 times and they make the finals. But we did it. We did about four or five of them and then we stopped. But they were great fun and we had great finalists. We had several sheet players win. We had a couple of nutcases win. And I, of course, <laughs> took advantage of the nutcases to make them famous. And it was really <laughs> terrific. And I'm glad it still exists because it means you have a job. I was going to say, can you imagine all these years later, somebody gets to collect a paycheck profiling the nutcases? That's pretty much me in a nutshell. I'm very proud of you. Will you profile the nutcase when you wrote the book? <laughs> <laughs> well, getting back to our serious topic today about the, the passing of Denny Phipps, he also played an important role specifically in your career, didn't he? Well, he did. When I first came to Naira, and I was not the typical Naira hire, and I'm using coded words there, uh, when I got out there and I've been on the radio, <laughs> that's how they hired me, uh, well, the guy that really tried to block my radio show was my boss. It couldn't be helped. Jack Crumpy, who hired me, said, he's got to be your boss because you're in marketing and promotion. So he was. And he didn't like me for reasons I understood. And his desire was to get rid of me. He put me in charge of renting the parking lot when we weren't there. That's the truth. I did get Jehovah's Witnesses. They took over Aqueduct <laughs> while we were at Saratoga. And so it's not funny. It's true. And I know. It just I sounds put, funny now. I did put a flea market in the parking lot, which lasted for many years and did quite well for the young man who put it on. But that was about it. So I did create the paddock club, which he couldn't stop me from doing. I went to the grandstand every day, an hour before the first or a half hour. I had the past performances of the Daily Double posted so people could look at it and maybe learn how to read it. And then I did the double caustically, as you can imagine, a lot of vicious <laughs> comments, but funny and entertaining and helpful. Believe me, it was helpful. One day, I couldn't get out of bed. I had sciatica. I never had it again, and I couldn't move, and I called in sick. And somebody said, well, who's going to do the paddock club? And somebody said, let Dave Johnson do it. He was the announcer and a rather well-liked and good announcer. Dave went down to do it, and the fans were not happy because he was being straight. He was handing out. They yelled, and they said, where's Harvey? Is Harvey sick? So away he went, and they went back and said they didn't want to listen to Dave. So Denny said, well, if he's so popular, why isn't he on the closed circuit television? And that was the beginning of my career, believe it or that's not. A, that's amazing. Without that, uh, without getting the, the high sign, the rub from Denny, you, the, 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 the TV show, and subsequently all of the prattle, uh, racing prattle that we see on TV and across simulcasting signals around the country might not have happened. My, the bad news is it probably would have. <laughs> Maybe not as soon. We don't know that. One day, this is a very good story. That I think it's in the book, but I went to lunch up in the trustees' dining room. That was another thing. Naira had a dining room reserved for trustees. There were about 24 of them, and the room was always empty during the week. Then on Saturday, they'd fill it, and they'd let people with horses in the big race have a table. But that was it. Denny started this, too. He said, look, 
if they bet enough, invite them up there during the week. Why should we have an empty room? Bring the big players upstairs. And it worked. And I see that's now done in a lot of racetracks around the country. A very good move. But I was up there having lunch, and Denny came in, and there were very few of us there, the people from Naira. And he said, come on, sit and have lunch with me. So I sat down, and we're eating, and it's about 10 of 1 before the first race. And a guy named Stewie Travis, who was one of our biggest bettors, who, of course, had been invited to the room, starts for the door. He's leaving the trustees' room, probably to go out and bet or whatever. And suddenly you hear a voice, Stewie, Stewie, who do you like in the first? The voice was from Jean MacArthur, widow of General <laughs> Douglas MacArthur. And Stewie looked at her and said, Mrs. MacArthur, I shall return. <laughs> Seen from the early days of the trustees' room. It's fantastic. Um, and then Denny said, who does that guy work for? And I said, Lehman Brothers. He said, no, he doesn't. I said, Denny, he's a, a customer's man at uh, Lehman Brothers. Hard to believe. Well, on Monday, it wasn't hard to believe. Because on the front page of the New York Times, Lehman's broker arrested or something for going to the racetrack and churning people's <laughs> money. <laughs> that is unbelievable. You must have met some crazy characters back in those days, both in your office and and, and around the plant. I understand your your office was sort of the the degenerate headquarters back in the day. Yes, it was, and uh, a lot of people in management didn't like it. And eventually, one of my good friends bounced the check, and uh, the room was cleared. <laughs> well, I, I if I get my uh, my time machine going. That, that, that's a place that I want to visit back then to see all the, uh, all the interesting folks from the, I mean, you know, beyond Runyon-esque it must have been back in the, back in the PAC office in the day. But, Harvey, thanks you so much for coming on. And, oh, you go ahead. I wrote about a lot of them. I'm just yeah, saying. Yeah, well, that's right. It's a, thank goodness we have it. Okay. If it's folks are interested. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Harvey. We we were going to have you back soon to talk about uh, to talk about Saratoga and the other racing topics of the day. Uh, appreciate your time. Thank you. Good luck in Keeneland. Cheers. Cheers. And uh, if you want to buy the book that Harvey was talking about, uh, which is entitled, of course, if you know anything about Harvey, "May the Horse Be With You," pack at the track. You can uh, you can buy it in the DRF store. If you're interested in a signed copy, we may be able to work something out. Send me a private message on Twitter, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see if we can get that taken care of to get your copy of May the Horse Be With You signed. What did you think of that, Mike? Pretty fun 10 minutes on the podcast, huh? <clears throat> yeah, we could we could uh, we could have a whole hour with Harvey just telling stories about the track, uh, and, and I would just sit there quietly listening. Uh, loved it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's great, and uh, I definitely wanted to pay a little bit of tribute to, to Diddy Phipps. There's a good piece uh, of sort of recapping uh, his memorial service on DRF.com right now by Dave Grenig, in which he's described by his friend Michael Bloomberg as the a winner of the Triple Crown of Life, which I think is a, mm -hmm. a tribute that he would have uh, that he would have surely appreciated. And I knew Harvey had a couple of those stories, though I did not remember the MacArthur Widow one. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's probably it for us. We've been here about an hour. We, you know to tune in for the webinar tomorrow to hear Mike and Steve Anderson. You know to come back and join us Friday, me, uh, Hogan, Kinchin, um, maybe Mary Rampolini if she's around. We'll, try, we'll, we'll preview some of the action Saturday from Oaklawn and Keeneland and around the country. I want to thank Steve Anderson. I want to thank Jonathan Kinchin. I want to especially thank Mike Hogan and double especially thank the great Harvey Pack for making this a special edition of the DRF Players Podcast. Of course, also, thanks to all of you. We will be back on Friday. May you win all your photos. <laughs>